Good morning. Today is Wednesday, August the 22nd, and this is Macroeconomics, ECO 2013. My name is Roger Strickland. I'll be your instructor for this term. I am going to attempt to video every class that we hold and post that video online. Come in, come in. Uh, I will announce that video with its URL uh, on announcements under Canvas. We'll get into that. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that I've got several hundred videos on. So many of your assignments will be to watch some of those videos. And on that same channel is where I will post our class meetings and whatever went on there. So be advised on that, that if you miss a class, you hopefully, technology permitting, you can go back and see what we might have done. Okay? Hmm. Where to start? So many things to say. My favorite question to begin the class is to ask you, what do you want to talk about? What's on your mind? And so I'll ask you to think about that before next week. And uh, maybe in some of the stuff you read, you find some <coughs> stuff that you want to chat about or you want to ask about, or like, what the hell is this? What, what does it mean? Why do I have to read this? That's fine. Or if you're watching the news, staying abreast of what's going on out in the world around us, you can come in and say, hey, I saw that China said such and such about Trump's tariffs. What does that mean? And we'll talk about it. And the more we talk about it, the more you get read into what's going on around us and how do I make some sense out of all of it. And as far as I'm concerned personally, that's the whole purpose of this course, particularly macroeconomics, is to give you some economic understanding that makes you able to make better sense of the world around us, and as a result, make better decisions and create a better future. Okay? That's what, that's the reason I teach, is I want to see you have a better future than you might otherwise have. And economics just happens to be the vehicle we're going to use to see if we can make that come true. Okay. So, let's do the administrative part more as a reminder of, of what's going on, and I'll use the board for this part. In this course, you've got two major sources for information. The first one is called Connect. This is, anybody here use Connect before in another course? Okay. How did you get into Connect? Do you remember? You went to the bookstore or you went online and you went to McGraw-Hill, who is our publisher. And then from McGraw-Hill, you looked for Connect and you bought an access code, a number. You buy the bookstore, you probably find it online somewhere else. Shop around, okay? Once you get the code, you go back and start looking for Connect and in the other series over here, Canvas, there is a website for this section, this course. Once you get that website URL, you can go to connect with your code and the URL, and you can register, and then you will get your materials in connect for this course. Let me show you very quickly what your connect page should look like. If you have multiple Connect courses, they'll be on this. But when you get into macro, <laughs> there we go. That's the sort of page you should be looking for. Okay? And what that page is going to show you is all of your Connect assignments for the course. And we want to talk through those, um, make you familiar with them. Not a big challenge. Connect is your one major source of information for this course. The other information source is on Canvas, which is our learning management system at Santa Fe. Has anyone here not used Canvas before? Okay. Um, you can log on. You tell me, how do you log on to Canvas? You can go through eSantafe. Go to eSantafe and, e -Santa Fe, and then look for Canvas button and log in with your number and, yeah, your, with your, and your password. ID and whatever password you have Good. for eSantafe. So very quickly, let's see if I can get that up. 
Um, this is the Canvas home page. Okay? When you get to that home page, you know you're at Canvas for this course. You'll have multiple courses on your on your page. Let me see if we can get back there just for a second. Um, I use the dashboard sometimes. First of the term, Canvas is not really with us yet either, apparently. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Pull the ripcord. Bingo. You should see your course is either listed this way or this way. But you're going to look for this course, which is macro, and that'll take you to the home page. Once you get to the home page, you know you're where you should be, and it's got your directions on it on how to get started. Okay, pretty straightforward. You want to get into Connect and get registered there very quickly so you can start doing those practice quizzes and learn smart homework assignments. It's got an e-book in there, an electronic book. So there's your textbook. You don't need to buy one somewhere else. If you want, anybody here want a print textbook? Anybody here hung up, I like a printed textbook? You can buy one. It's about 40 bucks extra, but you can buy one from McGraw-Hill or at the bookstore. Okay. When you get on here, follow the directions. The big thing up here, modules. When you click on the modules, that'll open up the course information, the course materials. Maybe, you know. Under admin or administrative documents, when you open that, you'll see a checklist for the course about getting registered. You'll see an information sheet. I want you to fill out and upload as an assignment. See assignments over here? You download this, fill it out, and then go to assignments, and you upload it, kind of like an attachment to email. Pretty, pretty simple. Then you'll find the course syllabus, policies. You're going to have a quiz over that. You may recall on, on Connect, there's a syllabus quiz. I want you to take, make sure you read the syllabus, see what's on there. Pretty minor. Not part of your grade, but make sure you're up to date. And then there's the course schedule, and this is the biggie. And I don't know if, how many of you have used Canvas. I don't generally load stuff in here because I can't read the damn thing. I download it. And... Get up to the beginning. This is the course schedule, which shows you week by week the assignments you've got and some comments. And you can work through the weeks, and you'll see that week by week you've got a number of videos to watch, a couple of articles to read, as well as what's on Canvas. Read the textbook, take the quizzes, whatever like that. That's pretty much the routine for this course. It's really straightforward. If you will do what I ask you to do, that is the quantity of work on time, people get through this course with a B fairly comfortably. The ones that don't make a, a B or at least a high C are typically the people that don't do the work or they do the work at the very last minute or they only do part of it, okay? which turns out to be a hell of a lot of students. But if you simply stay up with it, it's not that difficult. And then what do we do in the classroom? It's sort of a flipped classroom. Instead of me explaining stuff to you in a lecture in the classroom, you got all that crap on a videotape. You can pause it, take notes, watch it again. What did he say? That kind of stuff. When you come to class, bring me your questions. As you take those quizzes, if you find a quiz and you hit a question, you say, what the hell does that mean? You snip it out. There's a little snipping tool explained in the syllabus. It's on Microsoft uh, Office or Windows. You snip it out and bring it to class and turn it into me at the beginning of class and we'll, we'll talk about that question in class. If we can use the classroom to solve your questions, life's much easier. If you have not done any of this work and you come to the class, very little of it's going to make a lot of sense, very little of it's going to stick. So that's my first important point. In this course, if you will do the assignments and come to class and chat about things you have questions about, it's not going to be a problem. But it is going to take you some time during the week to do all that material. Watch those videos, take notes on them, take the practice quizzes, read the articles, take notes on them, okay? But I promise you, if you'll do all that, by the end of the term, you'll be a lot more aware and sensitive to what's going on around us and a lot better position to start making decisions on things like what courses am I going to take? What am I going to major in? What general career direction do I have in mind? What things are important to me? What things don't really matter? 
lot of what I think are more practical applied type decisions. Okay. So that's that's kind of the big thing. Questions at anybody? Get registered into Canvas. I, the price ranges from a hundred to one hundred and forty dollars for this kit. Okay, connect. Look around, search around, see what you can find. If you find it really cheap and you want to help your classmates, go back into Canvas, go to Discussions, and just post a little point. I found Connect at this web address for this much money. Love Roger. How's that? What the hell? You know? Do somebody a favor. Come on, Candace. As you, uh, these are again, these are the uh, administrative pieces of information. I've got a little autobiographical sketch of myself down here, so you can get to know a little bit about me. I'll have more to say on that next week. Um, maybe you want to read that and decide if I'm really crazy and you ought to drop the course. I don't know. After that, it's just a collection of readings for each exam. And as you read those articles, you want to take some notes on them. You can expect questions on them. And that's the direction we're going. Comments or questions so far? Anybody, anything? Do we take tests in class or anything? Your tests will be, thank you, uh, your tests will be given in a window of time, typically five or six days. And any time in that time you want to take them, you go down to the big open lab in 216, all this is in the syllabus, and you just walk in and take the test. You'll need a student picture or some kind of picture ID. Um, a couple of points about taking those tests. If, if you want to check their hours, because if they say we close at 7 o'clock, these tests are 90-minute tests. If you get there after 5.30, they won't let you even begin. That's problem number one. Problem number two, the exam, for example, the exam is open from Thursday until the next Tuesday. When do you suppose most people take the exam? Tuesday, what time? Five. Not before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right? They procrastinate, delay, and pray, maybe, and they take it very, very late. If you get down to the big open lab, and there is two or three courses that are already having their whole section in there, and then there's a bunch of other people taking individual exams, and you can't get an exam, you're screwed. I got no sympathy for that, okay? If you wait till the last minute and it's too crowded to get a computer, Sin Loy, sorry about that, okay? So don't wait till the very last minute, okay? Just get it done. So we won't lose any class time to take any exams. Another thing about class times. This class meets, I have two sections. One meets on Mondays, 9.30, B12. One meets on Wednesdays, today, 9.30, B12. You signed up for the Monday section, I guess. How many of you got an email from me? Anybody get an email from me? Interesting. I sent it out through eStaff. What I told you in the email, and I'll tell you now, is you are cordially invited and encouraged strongly to come to both sections if you possibly can. Okay? Just like it was a two-day-a-week class. Because I'm going to teach the course pretty much as though it meets both days. And in the day you don't get here, you get it on video. But if you can come to class both days on a regular basis, my experience is your grades definitely improve. So you're invited. I have those two sections, and I have two online sections. There are 27 people in a section. How's your, how's your math? How much is that? Can you do that math in your head? 180. 98 is not a bad guess. What the hell? You know. <laughs> okay. I've got 108 students. We've got about 45 seats in here. This place will never fill up. People won't come to class. Okay? I will begin taking uh, headcount, roster, attendance starting next week. I'll pass around a roster and I'll be counting your attendance. And if you've got excessive absences, that will lower your grade for this course, okay? Excessive to me is more than about three, okay? 
But if you miss a Monday and you want to come in on a Wednesday and you want credit for that, you just let me know. We'll make a note on the roster. But attendance is is going to be encouraged in the sense of if you don't come in, it will it will be I will adjust your grade accordingly. Subjectively. So please come when you can. Other questions, comments, anybody? You're not going to ask me about the bar fight I got in? <laughs> How does he look? I'm sorry? How does he look? Six weeks traction, six months rehab. <laughs> the problem of living in Florida, particularly as you age, is you pick up little minor skin cancers as you go along. And I had one cut off here a couple of weeks ago, and then this one. So that's what that is. I knew you were dying with curiosity. <laughs> What else? Comments, questions, thoughts? Sure. How long do you have to sign up for Connect? Um, the, the, the course you can sign into up until uh, maybe the first week of September. But if you delay getting into it, you're going to be that much further behind. So please do do that speedily. They offer like a two-week trial subscription. So you could try that, but I don't know that that does you much good unless you're good, because if you don't drop this course by next Monday, you still pay for it. So if you take the two-week trial, you may got to make damn sure when the two weeks is up, you resubscribe and buy the whole kit and get on board. Okay. Other comments, questions? To return to a point for a moment, we were looking at different media sources, um, and we were talking about the fact you and I need to be monitoring the media across the spectrum. I don't think we need to spend a hell of a lot of time reading this stuff down here, but sometimes it's entertaining, okay? Just to imagine people would publish nonsense like that, okay? But since we do want to read both sides of the spectrum, um, I'm going to give you at least my, my approach to it is I have a, an app on my phone whose name just escaped me, Flipboard. Anybody ever heard of Flipboard? Anybody here use it? If you're going to monitor the news and you're not the kind of person that watches the TV news, you don't read the newspapers, etc., load Flipboard onto your phone and when you set it up, it says, what are you interested in? And you can pick out, I mean, you can spend an hour picking out stuff you're interested in. Let's see what I've got here. Flipboard. That's not going to load either. Here we go. Uh, news, daily edition. I have, I have listed home decorating, business, travel, humor, politics, outdoors, interior design, home improvement, social justice, antiques, fly fishing, Buddhist, you name it. I'm kind of interested in that kind of stuff. You pick your whole list up, and it'll last longer than you will. So you got to stop at some point. And then it will begin. It's called a news aggregator. It's an important term we're going to use in this term. An aggregator. What does it mean to aggregate? Say it. To bring together, to add everything. It brings in news from all kinds of sources, including the trash. Okay. But that way, literally, you can sit down and in 10 minutes in the morning, you can scan through the news and see pretty much what's going on. The other one I like to use personally is uh, Google News, if I'm going to be on the computer. It, it is also a news aggregator, pulls in stuff from different sources, and I can read Google News in about you know, 10 or 15, 20 minutes in the morning. Anybody here read the Gainesville Sun, our local paper? I can read the Gainesville Sun in four, and half, four minutes and 22 seconds. There's just not that much in it, okay? And most of what I read in the Gainesville Sun, I've already seen several hours, if not a day or so before. So these are excellent ways to stay in tune with what's going on, and uh, we will occasionally discuss some of the stuff that we run across there. Okay, anything else? Let's see what else I've got on here. Here's a website that you might enjoy. Again, this will be posted on Canvas. It's called Political Compass. Political Compass.
compass. What is a compass used for? Navigation. Navigation and direction. Anybody here know how to read a map? Contour map? A Google map, Dan Skippy, what you really need. Yeah. Okay. Um, the political compass is a little quiz, a little survey, that lets you, as a result of that, gives you the results, identify yourself as more or less liberal, more or less conservative, etc. Okay? So just for the hell of it right now, what is the difference between a liberal and a conservative? It's not a joke, okay? This is serious. What do you think is the broad difference between people who call themselves conservative? who are over on the right, and people who call themselves liberal over on the left. Size and scope of government. Good. Excellent answer. The size and scope of government. To what extent should government be active and intervening in our lives? And what is the position of the right? The less the better. Not very damn much. Yeah. Less government is better. Is the left position that we need a lot of government? They would tell you, we need a lot of things fixed. There are problems that government is best suited to fix. I've never met a liberal who loved to pay taxes, but they had plenty of ideas on we need to fix this, this ain't right, this ain't fair, okay? And on the right side, they're saying, not only do I not like to pay taxes, I don't like anybody telling me what the hell to do, okay? And we'll see as we go along. And that's, that's probably the most distinctive difference can you think of any other differences between liberal and conservative? Any that you've run across? Um, maybe pro choice beliefs. Okay, who is pro choice and who is anti abortion? Liberals tend to be pro choice and they try to make it clear that doesn't mean we favor abortion, we just favor it as a right. Whereas on the, on the conservative side, very much opposed to the idea of abortion. What about gun control? Where are the liberals? They tend to be in favor of more restrictions on gun ownership and the exercise of, of carrying or managing a gun, etc. Okay. Any other differences? Who tends to be more um, pro-worker? Traditionally, the liberals were, and they were supported by unions and working-class America, but. Beginning in the 1970s, the Republicans undertook a program called the Southern Strategy, by which they attempted and indeed were successful in taking particularly the South, which was very Democratic, and moving it from Democrat to Republican points of view. And now there's perhaps some debate on who is most pro-labor. Who's pro-union? The liberals are pro-union for the most part, teachers, unions, etc. And you know, we could we'll talk about questions like, are you, what is a union first? What is a union? A workers' union. Anybody familiar with them? I have a few friends that are in a couple of different unions. Um, the cooperative of workers that come together to leverage um, themselves. Good. Think about it this way. A company goes out and it makes money. Oops, high tech down the tubes. A company goes out and it makes a lot of money. The money comes into the company. They pay their expenses and out of that they have profit. Everybody okay with that idea? Right? What happens to the profit? Because Option one, we reinvest it in the company. We buy bigger factories, we buy more modern equipment, whatever, we reinvest it. What's the other thing we can do? Another thing we can do with the, with the profit? Pay out shareholders' dividends. Pay it to the owners as either dividends or if it's a sole proprietorship or partnership, they, they get the money, the owner. What's the third option? <clears throat> Pay it to your workers in better wages or benefits. And nobody came up with that in here. You gotta believe me, 30 years ago in this class, half the class or better would say, well, you can take care of your workers. We don't hear that anymore. There's been a fundamental social change in the social contract of America. Workers don't get much attention anymore, okay? What do you suppose happens to profits today? 
Where does it go? The biggest part of it has gone back to owners. With Trump's tax cut recently, stocks are going in buying their own stock on the market so they don't have to pay out as many dividends to different people. So now the people who remain the owners get better dividends, better stock prices. They have not been reinvesting a lot in new equipment and technology, and they damn sure haven't been paying their workers more. Okay? Because in order to make profits, what do you got to do? If you want to increase the profit in a business, there's two ways to do it. What do you think it is? Decrease costs. Decrease costs or increase revenues. Bring in, bring in more money or put out less money. What do you think we've been doing for 35 years? We have been cutting costs. And what's the most expensive cost to most businesses? Labor. Workers are not simply expensive, but pardon my French, they're a pain in the ass. You got that? All they do is whine and bitch and cry and show up late and want more and sabotage you and, you know, labor's expensive. And it's gotten, and again, this is kind of a social contract in America. American businesses for 35 years now have said the best way to show a profit next quarter is to cut staff, cut staff, cut staff. And so we've decreased the size of the workforce. We refuse to give them much in the way of pay increases. And that way our profits are looking good. But where does this have, what does this have to do with unions? If you had a union, what would the union be saying about that? Employees shouldn't be overworked and they would negotiate labor. Contracts. The union is going to say, Look, damn it, we know how much profit you're making, we want our share. We want our share. And if you don't give us our share, better benefits, higher wages, whatever, better working conditions, what are we going to do? Protest. We're going to do more protest. We're going to go on strike. What happens if we all go on strike? You got no damn business because we're some of your best, most productive workers. You can't replace us overnight. We're not out there digging ditches. We're doing pretty damn skilled work. And if we go out on strike, your business is shut down for a week, two weeks, a month, six months. What happens to your profits then, Jack? But if that's the role traditionally of unions, what's happened to unions for the last 35 years? They've lost power significantly. They, yeah, there are fewer and fewer and fewer unions and far, far, far fewer workers who belong to unions. And so the Democratic Party, pro-labor, pro-union, says we need to correct that because we've had legislation passed by the Congress that really made it difficult for unions to operate. And we need to change that legislation. I don't know. What do you think? Good idea or bad idea? Would more unions be better for America? That's kind of a question this course is all about. It certainly would be better for the workers if they could get higher wages, right? But would it be better for the business? Then you have to ask, well, what's the purpose of business? Is the purpose of business to make profits? Then it wouldn't be good for the business. They'd have higher labor costs. So what do you think? How many of you would vote in favor of more unions or, or legislation to help unions? Anybody? Two. I wouldn't give it like free reign. It has to be Absolutely. Got to gotta have restrictions. We know what Americans are like after a few beers. <laughs> Known as free reign, right? How many of you think uh, you, we don't need any damn unions? All they do is cause problems. One. So I'm guessing there's probably 20, 25 of you in here today. Three people have an opinion. That's not impressive. There's no charge for having an opinion. It's free so far. Okay. But I want you to think about it. I want you to be able to engage in a conversation with somebody about it and talk about it intelligently. Okay? All right. I don't want this class to be something where I do all the talking. Have you got a friend anywhere that you occasionally go out and you have a cup of coffee or a beer with and just shoot the breeze? Somebody like that? Have you got more than one? Right? 
Okay. I want you to imagine just for a minute that you and I, one-on-one, -on -one, and two or three other people, go out to a restaurant, sit out at the table outside and have a cup of coffee two mornings a week, and we sit and chat about what's going on in the world. Okay? We don't get rude, we don't get too excited, but we talk about what's going on around the world, maybe what's going on in your life. I'll share you one, share you one with you for me right now, okay? I've got a couple of rental condos in this town. And the other day I sat down to pay the water bill on one that's been vacant for a couple of months. The water bill was $650. What do you think I did? I dropped everything I was doing and drove to that condo to see how deep the water was inside. And I got there and the place is dry. And I had a little note from Gainesville Regional Utilities, the utility guys. They had come out and read the meter, saw that I'd used a hell of a lot of water, and turned it off. God bless them. But now i got to figure out what am I going to do. I'm getting ready to call a leak detection company who's going to come out and try to locate where the leak is. And then, at my cost, we're going to have to dig it up or whatever it takes and replace some pipes underground. There's nothing in the yard spots no in fact from the water meter to the condo is parking lot yeah about about half again as deep as this room so I can see a six hundred and fifty dollar water bill and about six thousand dollars worth of excavation and you know repiping and is any of that going to be covered by like your insurance or the homeowners association no homeowners insurance doesn't cover it the association is not responsible for anything inside the meter to the condo so this would be the kind of thing over a cup of coffee, and we might be spicing this coffee with a little brandy. I'd be asking you, any advice? Those are the kind of conversations I think are worth having in life. Getting to know people, making social contacts, understanding each other, and talking about not just our personal problems, but maybe what's going on in the world, you know? So if you could possibly think of coming to class on that basis, this is not meant to be a demanding, beat you over the head, punish you, threaten you college class. It's meant to be, come on to class and let's shoot the breeze for a while, okay? Let's talk about what's going on in the world. And in the background, the stuff you have read, the stuff you've studied and practiced, there'll be some concepts and theories that we'll talk through, and, and I'll clarify them if you need me to, and we'll talk about what they mean, what they don't mean, okay? That's the way I want to run the class. I want to have a lot more back and forth from you. A couple of you have been very helpful in, in contributing. I'd like all of you to start feeling comfortable in speaking up, okay? That's where I'm headed. What's on your mind? Food, I'm hungry. Food, I'm hungry. <laughs> if you don't want to get hungry in the morning, if you get up, Maybe you've got to have a quick breakfast and you don't want to get hungry for at least until noon or maybe until late afternoon or evening. What should you have for breakfast? Protein. Pardon? Protein. A bagel and like eggs. Somebody said protein. Mm -hmm. That's long Frequently. I get up, I eat one, maybe two hard-boiled eggs, a cup of coffee, and I'm good till 6 o'clock. Protein takes much more time to break down and for your body to process and it keeps you from getting hungry. What will make you hungry is carbs. Bread, that kind of stuff, pancakes. Right? <laughs> so if you, if you see those days of the week when, damn, I'm not going to have time to have breakfast, at least eat a little protein. Maybe, you know, some sausage, some kind of meat, some cheese, protein. That'll, that'll carry you a little further. Not a good thing to be doing every damn day, you know. Okay. Any other thoughts about food? Say again? I think it's it's difficult to overdo it. Yeah, protein's good for you. Although I did see in the news over the past week uh, numerous articles about low carb diets shorten your life. You need carbs. You need carbs, but but what? Not too many. Perfect. Exactly my words. You need carbs, but not too many. You need protein, maybe not too much. Okay. What's the lesson behind that? It's all in one word. Moderation. Perfect. Moderation. Technical failure again. 
Moderation. How do you find it? I've been, I've been looking my entire life and I just like bounce back and forth. Oh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of cues here. Moderation in all things. Uh, I attended the University of Florida and when I graduated with a bachelor's degree, I immediately went into the United States Army and I served for five years as a second lieutenant up through a captain in armor branch, tanks, okay? And when you become a commissioned officer in the United States Army, at least at that time, they gave you a small book called The Officer's Guide. And it was basically about a how to behave as an officer. And one of the most important things in there, I thought, was this phrase, moderation in all things. What does that mean with respect to drinking? Alcohol. It means you don't have more than two drinks anywhere you go in public. Got it, Captain? Lieutenant? Two drinks, max. That's not a bad rule of thumb for you in your personal career, professional career, out in the, the civilian world. What if you go to lunch with your new boss? You've been at the job for two weeks. He says, come on, we're going to go to lunch. And three or four of you go to lunch. And the waitress shows up and says, uh, can I get you guys something to drink before we have anything? And the boss says, make mine a double martini. What are you going to order? Old-fashioned. <laughs> Anybody else got an opinion? I'd probably just stick to soda or water. Soda or water? Fine. Okay. A single. Say again? A double, a double martini? I would suggest you stay off the radar and you at most have one drink and probably not even one drink till you learn the lay of the land. Because I have known bosses who like to do that to new employees just to see what you'll do. Okay? Don't give yourself away. Okay. What do you do if the waitress asks you first? Can I get you something to drink? What do you say? Water with lemon, please. Damn skippy. That's called moderation and don't be stupid, right? Moderation in all things. Don't do too much, don't do too little. What's the key, the key to moderation? Finding your balance. Finding your balance, and when you find your balance, what word should come to mind? Most important word in the English language. No. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I have seen more people destroy their lives, literally, destroy their lives, destroy their careers, destroy their families, because they don't know how to say no. They don't know how to draw the line. They don't know how to find the balance. Okay? I, I had in mind to draw a picture for you today, just kind of set the tone. Um, this is me. This is you. What do you think I'm talking about? Life experience. Life experience? Yeah, maybe. It could be that I've, I'm a mama's boy and I've lived at home most of my life. I am a mama's boy. I'm an only child. I'm spoiled rotten. And if you don't like it, you can go to hell. Next. Huh? You're so nice. Huh? Years? You just lost a letter grade in first, girl. But you're right. I got more years than you do. Wisdom? Oh, you got an extra boost up on that grade. That's good. This is a portrayal of how many times we have screwed up. You have screwed up a few things in your life here and there, no doubt. Even if it was failing to take the trash out one night. You're an amateur. This is the pro. I have screwed up to a fairly well. Okay? So probably anything you want to talk about, any problems you might be experiencing, concerns you might have, come and talk to me anytime. We can meet in my office over at 831. We can go over to Coffee 101 at the library, have a cup of coffee and chat about it. We can meet off campus if we need to, whatever time. My office hours show is being Monday and Wednesday, either before this class or starting about 1215 when I get out of class. But if you can't make it at those times, email me. We'll find a time. We'll sit down and chat anytime. I screwed up more things than you have, and I can do it with just a screwdriver. That's all it takes. <laughs> So, what else on your mind? Are you ever going to tell us what happened with the water bill? <laughs> when I get it solved, I will. <laughs> Remind me. Remind me. Okay. 
That's when I might exceed moderation. What else? Would you be willing to uh, share the information of the demo company that you use? I certainly will. My pool came out of the ground during the last hurricane. It's an uh -oh. indoor pool. Uh oh. Okay. I certainly will. Uh, the property manager for the condo association is contacting me eventually. Plus, I have the email for the homeowner that had a similar experience over there. As I gather this, and if you will remind me, I'd be glad to share that. Yeah. Okay. Do you think having taken micro will help at all in this class? In a, in a low-level sense. You understand supply curves, demand curves, and how they move. Other than that, you know, it's pretty much a whole different course. Yeah. How much will we be saving the LRAS graph? How much what? Will we be saving the LRAS graph? The long run by aggregate supply graph? Why do you ask about that particular curve? It's not fun. I think, I think you're going to see a lot of it, but I don't think you're going to find it complicated. Okay. Let me share something with you. It's not complicated. It's just not fun. Not, not fun. Yeah. I can understand that. I don't think it's particularly fun, but I think it's, A, it's not very complicated and it explains a lot, but you just don't have to make a big deal out of it. Um, look forward here. here we go. Like I said, I've got a YouTube channel with a bunch of economics videos on it. It's been up for six or seven years. I clipped out a few of the comments from there. I want to share them with you to kind of, not to brag, but to reassure you that those videos can do you some good. Some guy is earning his distinction in economics in South Africa and said, thank you. Some guy said, this, I like this one. You explained in 10 minutes something my lecturer couldn't cover in a whole semester. I get that comment a lot. I think I can take the LRAS and explain it to you in three minutes, and it'll never trouble you again. I didn't say it'll be fun, but it won't trouble you. Okay. Um, I was going literally crazy and cried for no understanding, but I got it thanks to you. That's, that's minor. But uh, there's one from Sweden, ability to make things easy to understand. A uh, guy taking AP tests. I like this one. You, my good sir, have explained two weeks' worth of economics lessons in the span of half an hour. I think those videos are pretty to the point. They're not long ones. Um, <laughs> I can't understand my lecture in my college, but you somehow made it so simple and easy. Okay, that's progress. Can make under uh, econ sound easier and understandable. Ah, here we go. With this video, I understood more than reading an economics book for two days. Incidentally, when you begin reading the textbook for this course, be careful. It's good that it's an electronic book because it's on your screen. Because if you buy the hardbound copy and you read it on your couch laying down, when you drop it falling asleep, it'll hurt you. It'll break your nose. Bore, the economics is the most boring course, the textbook, written by the most boring people God ever put on this earth. So do not try to sit down with that textbook and read it for more than about 10 minutes at a go before you stop. Walk around, take a deep breath. Because if you read it more than about 10 minutes, you look up and say, what did I just read? It's really boring, and it, just, it doesn't stick real quick. So allow some time for that. I had a, I had a high school AP class uh, up in North Carolina get on uh, Skype with me. And we did most of the course that way. So that was kind of fun. Okay, again, the comments there are simply to let you know that, that actually the videos have proved very useful for a lot of people. And please stay up with them, watch them. They're all listed by URL. Cut and paste them into your browser. Take some notes. Okay, anything else on your mind? What is your opinion on a universal basic income? Hmm. Specifically as a way to mitigate... Um, a replacement of the labor force by automation. You've, you've raised two issues, yes. both of which we want to talk about, neither of which I'm going to give you an answer for. <laughs>
with universal basic income, and you have robotics, et cetera, um, displacing labor. Are you going to get out there and work in the workforce for 10 years and then lose your job to a robot? Because robots are getting pretty damn smart. Artificial intelligence. They're going to be able to do most of what you do. What are you going to do if that happens? What are you going to do to preclude that from happening? you got to be damn valuable if I'm going to keep you instead of hiring buying a robot. Say again? If you go into a different field, my problem is personally that unless you're going into another field, if you're staying in the same area and you get a master's degree, I'm not convinced that's going to make you any more productive or more, more valuable to me than the experience you have for the last five years. So you've got to be careful. Yes, ma'am? I think this is more with like human contact. Like if, let's say we had a robot for a teacher, I think we'd learn better with like a person than with a robot. Absolutely. A thousand percent agree with you. Um, there are jobs and activities that require the human element. One of those, by the way, I think is teaching, and I am not a proponent of online education. Okay? I think online education, I may have to edit this out of the video, I think online education is the biggest scam ever perpetrated on the American educational public. I think it's an excellent approach for about 10% of the students. That's the 10% who do more than simply watch the computer. They get out and lead a life. They make contact with people. They have social skills, et cetera. For the rest of the folks, it's just a, for some of them, it's a necessity. It's the only way I can get the course because I have to work, and I understand that. But for a great many more, maybe you've seen some of it. People take online courses because, hey, I don't have to go to class. And what does that lead to? Hey, I don't have to do a damn thing. What does that lead to? Oh, hey, I've got to take the course again. Job security. You know. um, are we are we getting to the point to where we're going to have enough robots and other technology that we don't need as many people working as we used to have? Not for a while. Though. You don't think so? Like now they have robots flipping burgers and stuff, and I feel like that's going to take a lot of people's jobs. Absolutely. But it's not here yet. Like prominently. Oh, like it's, it's coming, but it's not quite yet. The technology is here, but it has not been commercialized. Yeah, it's exactly. not been widespread. Well, but, you have like when you go to public Target, you have self checkout. Yep. That's taking away from someone that works as a cashier. Yep. And you think I, mean, I use self checkout. Amazon. Amazon just said Amazon. when they bought Whole Foods, they ended up doing the uh, this mm -hmm. no checkout. Like you can just go in, pick something up, walk out, and it'll Charging. Somebody was describing that, that phenomenon. They've got the, the self-monitor or monitored checkout. He says, I feel like I'm shoplifting. I go in there, I pick it up, I go home. I don't have to do anything. That's because they're tracking you, bud. We just charged your account. That's coming. I think you're right. Yeah. So should we think about trying to provide those people without jobs or maybe every citizen a minimum level of income every month so that if you don't have a job, you can at least afford food, shelter, maybe health care. Universal health care fits kind of under there, too. Okay? What do you think about that idea? Bad idea? So then what should we do with these people who lose their jobs because they either have very little skills or their skills are replaced by robots? What should we do with them? Provide jobs for them? Say again. Provide jobs for them? Mm, what kind of jobs? Isn't it more of a situation where we shouldn't have technology taking over people's jobs? Like we shouldn't be worrying about the people, we should be worrying about the technology. We should be worried about the technology. But that's inevitable. Mm -hmm. You said maybe we should provide them jobs. I want you to remember that idea, okay? Because that's what we did in the Great Depression. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. My biggest fear is that if too many people become unemployed at one 
time and we lose confidence in the economy and people stop spending, then the worth of the dollar goes down and it's just like a cascading effect where there's basically an economic collapse because no one has... One of the central themes, one of maybe three central themes to this course is what makes, what makes it possible for you to have a job when you go out looking for one? What is it that makes this economy work? What does it make somebody want to go into business, create a product or service, hire workers? Money. Money. What is it that, that keeps you from losing a job if you have one right now? Dedication. Not necessarily. Some of the most dedicated workers, we don't need them anymore because they've been replaced by a robot. And you use the word I want to emphasize. It's the key, one of the key words of this whole course. It's called spending. As long as you and I are out there spending money, we are creating jobs for other people, we are creating opportunities for new businesses to say, hey, would you like that in red? Okay? As long as spending stays up, the economy works. But if you take a large percentage of our population and say, you got no job, see ya, what happens to spending? It plummets and then sets in a multiplier effect. The multiplier effect. You got a business, you're selling shoes. And suddenly, you lose 50% of your business because people can't afford to buy shoes. How are you going to react? What are you going to do in your business? You're going to order less shoes to keep in the store, right? What does that do to your supplier? He's lost business too. What are you going to do with the 15 or 20 employees that you have right now? You're going to lay off some of them, maybe half of them. What do you think your supplier's doing? Same thing. When we start laying off those workers, what happens to spending? It goes further down. And as they spend less, the process repeats itself. That's the multiplier effect. So if in fact, and we're, we're imagining, if in fact you have large-scale replacement of labor by capital, by equipment, machinery. What's going to happen to the spending flow in our economy? Well, we've already seen what happens for the last 35 years. For the last 35 years, we've been keeping wages relatively low, very small increases for the lower wage occupations. And so they are spending less. And so it's become more and more difficult for companies to create new products, to cut costs, to become more profitable. Imagine that on a tenfold increase. You cannot simply take 20%, 30% of the workforce and say, sorry, you don't have a job, not my problem. It is our problem. We're all in this lifeboat together. And when your profitable business doesn't have enough customers, you ain't got no profitable business anymore. In a macroeconomic sense, if we go around and we cut the wages of our workers, we're cutting the spending power of our customers. We're cutting our own throats. Henry Ford, the story goes, discovered this many years ago when he looked out on his assembly line at all his workers and calculated what he was paying them. He said, my workers can't even afford to buy the automobile that I want for every man. They can't even afford to buy the automobile that we're making. So he went out and increased wages. In Seattle, in Seattle, they came across with the idea, said, we're going to raise the minimum wage in the city to $15 an hour. What do you suppose businesses said? You're out of your freaking mind. Particularly restaurants said that, because restaurants pay very low anyway. They said, we can't survive if you do that. But they did it. Guess what happened? So became more, everything became more. Business is booming because more people have more money and they're spending it. Okay? So this is an important thing too. It's called a paradox. What's true for a single company isn't necessarily true for everybody at one time. If you tell me in my company I gotta pay everybody 15 bucks an hour, I'm screwed. Because my competitors are gonna kill me. I, they don't have those labor costs, I do. But if you tell everybody you're going to raise wages $15 an hour, you may get a, gift, a different conclusion. 
you may get enough more spending to offset that. We don't know. We're doing experiments with that. We're doing experiments with this universal basic income. If I promised you $1,000 a month for the rest of your life, whether you're working or not, how would that change your behavior? Ah, uh, you mean you wouldn't just buy a hammock and have somebody mix your martinis and bring them to you in the backyard? No? That's not a lot to live off of. That ain't a lot to live off of. That's maybe enough if you put four of you together and rented a really dinky place, you could survive, but you sure wouldn't prosper. Right? I think. <laughs> raise, like, like raising minimum wages, doesn't it get more expensive to live in that like area? Yes. Yes, but then the question goes this way. If your wages go up by 20%, but your cost of living goes up by 10%, are you better off? Yeah. But if your wages go up by 20% and your costs go up by 40%, you're worse off. So the question is not are they going to go up, but relatively how much are they going to go up? And that's the questions we're asking with experiments. We're asking about universal basic income. We're running experiments on that in different countries of the world today. And we're gauging what do people do when they have this guaranteed income? Do they stop working? Do they become slugs? Do they become lazy, worthless? Or do they say, whoa, now I can afford to do this or do that? And they, in fact, work at least as much or even harder. We don't know the answer to that. But it's a hell of a good question because that may be part of the reality we face. Robotic displacement, if you will. What countries are they testing for? Finland was one, Canada was one in select cities, not throughout the country, but just within general areas. Those two pop into my mind immediately. If you just, you, UBI or Universal Basic Income on Google, I'll give you several citations. One of them in Canada was recently suspended, but not because it didn't work, but because they think they had the structure wrong. And so they're reorganizing it and gonna continue to try it again. So my, my biggest fear with that is the point that you brought up earlier that if it's not um, executed properly or at a large enough scale that it might be um, a, pointless. A tremendous disincentive to work. A it's real reason for a lot of people like to be slow. A cultural shift as well with Absolutely. the way that we do work. Absolutely. But I think for a lot of us, if you gave me that minimum income so I know I can afford health care or I know I'm going to be able to feed my kids, that takes a lot of the stress off and now I'm going to become more productive. Okay? And then we have to ask, for people with very, very low incomes, for whatever reason, maybe they deserve it, maybe they're worthless, maybe they don't, what happens to their, their well-being, their health well-being, their mental well-being, etc., as a, a, a result of living in poverty? And you have a much higher incidence of physiological problems. So does, are there some benefits to this program that we're maybe not quite measuring yet? These are the questions economics is all about. Should we do this or should we do that? What is the benefits? What are the costs? Be aware of what's going on around us. Also, if we're more in tune with what's going on in the economy, we're better able to make decisions about our personal lives. Uh, in 2000, December of 2007, the housing economy collapsed and our economy went down the tubes. Spending fell. We went into what we call a recession. And in fact, we call it the Great Recession, the worst time since the 1930s. I watched that happen. I was in a sort of protected position. I've got tenure. I've been here forever. I'm okay. But I watched the economy going to hell. And as I saw that happening, I changed my investment scheme, many of my investments. I moved them from some stocks and bonds, stocks primarily, into a couple of mutual funds where I was invested in companies like Dollar General, Walmart, Target, what we call consu consumer staples. They sell the stuff that everybody's got to buy every month. And by seeing the economy and what was going to, happen, going to happen and moving my money, I came out a hell of a lot better. Okay? So if you're cognizant of what's going on in the world around you, you can make better decisions. There are good times and there are bad times to be buying a house or buying a car. And if you see what's going on around you, you see the opportunities and you see the dangers. We must be informed 
to make intelligent decisions. We can disagree on principles, we can disagree on liberal and conservative, but let's all agree that we need to look around and see what the hell's going on before it sneaks up and bites us right in the ass. Okay? Pardon my French. Yes, ma'am? I feel like it was crazy, though, that a lot of people even took the bait when it came to giving out all those home loans. Mm -hmm. Like, no one thought, like, okay, so I'm getting a loan for a house. So it's like 10 other people I know. Like, no one saw that as, Oh, you know. oh. this is called the theory of the greater fool. Okay? I can get a loan and buy a house for $100,000, even though I know I can't afford it. But I went out and got the loan. Why did I get the loan? Because they gave it to you. Anything. Yeah. Didn't cost me anything. And I figured by the time I had to make my first or second mortgage payment, which I couldn't afford, I would already have sold the house to a bigger fool who paid $130,000 for it. The same way stocks did in the 1920s. People are buying stuff, not because they're going to live in it, not because they can afford it, not because it's a good investment for them personally. They're buying it because they think the market's going up and they can turn it. It's called speculation. In a sense, yeah, another big joke. But you're exactly right. Intelligent people, maybe not at first, but pretty quick looked around and said, this is crazy. All these people are out there buying houses they can't afford. They're getting these stupid easy loans. This is crazy. Housing I mean, prices went crazy. Could, like their jobs, like some people lost their jobs because of that too. So Which people gonna... lost their jobs? People that bought the homes. The people that bought the homes and then wanted to sell it, but by that time the rest of the world had looked around and said, oh, that's a stupid price. I don't think I'm going to pay that. You're screwed. You know, you're making $30,000 a year, you got your $2 million home and a $4,000 a month mortgage payment, and you thought you were going to sell it, and now you can't. Well, not only can you not make your mortgage payment, but your company and its customers, remember spending, in the same boat. Spending drops, your customer, your company loses sales, they turn to you and say, it's too nice working with you. And you've lost A, your job, B, your home. And this has been true particularly for my generation. What do we call my generation? The baby boomers. Because there are so many of us, born post-World War II. A lot of people in my generation lost everything they owned. Savings, home, job, everything. Because they got caught up in that mania of if I buy it at this price, I can sell it at that price. And they didn't think about anything else. We'll, we'll explore that. We call it a Minsky moment. A guy named Minsky, he describes it. When prices on something get so high, everybody looks at it and says, nah, I don't know, I'm not going to buy anymore. And when everybody stops buying, the price goes straight down through the floor. I, not trying to brag, but, but being aware, being aware, I bought condos when I saw that price go through the floor. And condos I bought at that time for 50000 52000 today are worth eighty to 90000 uh, I've got one that I bought on a foreclosure for sixty four. It's worth 122 now. So if you're aware of what's going on, while people make stupid mistakes, you can still prosper. You can still, and at least you can avoid doing stupid things yourself if you're aware of what's happening. All right. Other comments, other questions? Do me a favor. Put your name on a piece of paper and leave it up here on your way out. You can do that. Be sure you check Canvas. Be sure you get on to connect. If you can make it next month, I would be delighted to see you. And if not, I'll see you next Wednesday. Peace with honor.